Thank you, Connie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, a public health intervention. There's more people than there are seats, and that's um, that's due to the topic, uh, not the speaker I know. So, but it's also good for your health if you stand up. So, if you're so inclined, halfway through the talk, if you're seating, maybe exchange seats with somebody who's standing. And just uh, I know not, I know some people need to sit, but just uh, uh, it is good to get up out of your seat. Um, so. Um, so I'm going to talk about the journey we've been on with cannabis legalization. Um, this is a really, there's been a very fascinating experience and remains a fascinating one where there's still lots to do, uh, the complexities of this. But, I, it, it, but I'm very interested in the interface between public health and the law because I have a strong belief that legal tools uh, have the potential to have a significant impact, positive or negative, on the health of a population. So, which is my field, so how do we, I, I'm very interested in how do we actually strengthen the interface between health and the, and the legal uh, community uh, to, to do things like consider should substances be legal or illegal. And as we're doing in Canada, a grand experiment of shifting a whole category of substance, cannabis, and it's psycho and it's and it's two kind of main uh, uh, psychoactive substances, THC and, and CBD, shifting them from legal, or sorry, illegal to legal. And how do we do? So I'm going to talk about the journey we've been on, trying to find a balance uh, of the different objectives in there, and and uh, where we've landed, but also where we where we continue to go, and some of the challenges moving forward from there. So. Um, I didn't get a chance to put on edibles on there, but this is, so the journey started, if you folks you can recall, we have a prime minister who back in the federal, last federal election made a promise to legalize cannabis. Um, there's certainly been 20 years or more of significant lobbying and efforts to try to do that, but uh, this is so, and I, I'm uh, a plug for my afternoon seminar this afternoon, it's around a policy discussion. The prime minister then opened a policy window. And so advocacy is all about timing. So before then, there was no appetite. All of a sudden, you had a, had a leader and uh, somebody in an elected position who was open to the, po the policy po possibility. So then what do we do with that? The government step then was a, in the, about a, uh, eight to 10 months later, they created a task force. Folks may have participated in that, uh, led by um, a, a former politician and, and, and uh, Chief Justice, uh, Ann McClellan who they went around the country, uh, had consultations with large groups. I participated with a group of, of, uh, of government officials from the four Atlantic provinces in an all-day session with them, uh, August of 2016. They had all sorts of online mechanisms for public input. All that work then resulted in a task force report, which was released just before Christmas 2016. Um, and the outcome of that was Bill C-45, which legalizes cannabis, and then Bill C-46, which revamps substantively uh, the, the federal legal framework against uh, impaired driving. 
I think it's fair to say that if you look at as we go through the bill, if you've had a, if you under, understand and have read what's in the task force report, the the government leaned federal government leaned very heavily on the task force report report recommendations, and we were on target for we were meant to be July first, uh, two thousand eighteen. It's probably good we didn't legalize cannabis on Canada's national <laughs> birthday. Uh, that would have led to some interesting issues. But we ended up having October seventeenth, two thousand eighteen, that cannabis or some forms of cannabis became legal. And what I do need to add in there is that there is a commitment by the federal government, and we'll get into this, that no later than October 17, 2019, edible and concentrated, edible cannabis products and concentrates and what they're calling topicals will become legal as well. Um, so I think it's for to start, where did we land in terms of a legal responsibility? So the federal government has retained that it's their legal responsibility, and then with that comes all the, the responsibility around compliance, enforcement, et cetera, that they're in control of the production and licensing. So if you want to be a legal cannabis producer, there's a whole series of requirements that you have to meet to get a federal license, and you'll be federally uh, inspected. And that, that same, those same requirements around that exist today for production and licensing of leaf, leaf product, dried product, will remain intact for, uh, for, the, for edible products. And I'll come back to that because that's important because what it really means is that if you, uh, the only way a restaurant could actually serve cannabis-infused foods is to become a licensed producer. Um, and we'll come back to that. They've also committed that it's the federal responsibility to establish what they call a seed to sale tracking system. So how are we going to monitor product, uh, both in terms of uh, how much product is being produced, where is it being distributed, who's buying it, uh, what kind of a recall system do you have to establish to, 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 uh, to respond based on and having a seed to sale tracking system that will allow you to do that. They have also indicated that the, the medical cannabis, the, the, the system for accessing medical cannabis, and I use the word cannabis, not marijuana, even though it's on the slide, because um, cannabis is a more specific scientific uh, term than, than marijuana. The, the medical cannabis system, which has been in place for close to 20 years, roughly, uh, where if you uh, believe you have a medical condition that would benefit from cannabis, and you get authorization from a physician, you can then, with that authorization, uh, then uh, access uh, cannabis, medical cannabis, and the only way to access it right now is online and get it delivered to your home. They've maintained that as a separate system from non-medical uh, cannabis system. Uh, and we'll come back to that, whether that's how, you know, whether that those two systems are necessary, the pros and cons, that's one of the issues moving forward. The federal government also extent, ex, set up some rules around what the minimal legal age and around home cultivation. Um, but they then gave the province, shifting to provinces, they gave the provinces the ability to uh, uh, go further and more uh, have, uh, um, uh, if, if they chose in those areas. What they led, the rest of what they were landed with the province was really, so the federal government are the, are, the, are the production side. The responsibility was then left with the provinces around how around the wholesale, the distribution, and then the retail model, as well as the rules around public consumption. And then much of the enforcement of this, because that's done through policing, is actually becomes then a provincial and a municipal responsibility around not on the production side, but around. Um, people who were perhaps you accessing and using cannabis outside of the legal framework that becomes a police enforcement issue. <coughs> so I think it's important that so the, the, the objectives or the purpose of, of, of uh, legalizing cannabis is laid out in Section 7 of the Act, and I think it's important to go through that. So I, as a public health person, uh, I'm very pleased to see that the first objective is to protect the health of young persons by restricting their access to cannabis. So that's a public health and public safety focused objective, uh, as well as the second bullet, protecting young persons from inducements to use cannabis. So that's about marketing, et cetera. So right away with that purpose statement gives you some, uh, some, some idea of, where, of, of why uh, the limitations on marketing, et cetera. The other objective really then comes with produce, uh, creating a legal, mark, a, a legal production system and then a legal market. 
with the uh, with the objective to try to shift uh, the, the 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 production and the use of cannabis from into that legal market and minimize the illegal market. Um, and one of the outcomes of that should be a reduction of the burden on the criminal justice system uh, by creating legal cannabis. A third objective, kind of high level objective, is creating a quality control supply. With an illegal market, there's absolutely no way to control the quality and safety of the product, and that's by making it legal and all the criteria that go into uh, being a legal producer and all the safety issues, then you have that ability for quality control. And the last objective is, which is actually as you uh, raise public awareness on the health risks. Uh, and I think this is an important one that we're, now that we have a cannabis is legal, we can actually have uh, a much more open and informed dialogue around the risks and any potential benefits of cannabis. Whereas as, as long as it remained illegal, it was really hard to talk about cannabis in a detailed way in schools, for instance or engage young communities around a discussion around cannabis. Now we can do that in a much more evidence-informed way. So those are the high-level objectives. So what was it, what's actually in Bill C-45? So the federal government set an age limit of 18. So you had to be 18 or older to possess, can, uh, possess and use cannabis. But again, they gave provinces and territories the ability to go beyond that if they chose. And the amount, and they, so you can possess 30 grams, up to 30 grams of dried cannabis, or they've got formula of the equivalent, because what was legalized was fresh dried oils uh, and then plants and seeds. People who are under the legal age uh, have possessed more than five grams will be subject to federal legal uh, jurisdiction, so the Youth Criminal Justice Act. They also set a limit that a household, and their definition of household was um, I don't have a friend, but it's fairly broad. So I kind of use people, some of you in the audience will get this from Dallas. So uh, a, 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 um, a student house with six bedrooms, that's not six households, it's one household. <laughs> <laughs> so, there, so, be, but there, in, so in a household, you can present, there can be up to four cannabis plants. The draft legislation had some restrictions on size, though in, in the consultation and then the back and forth between Parliament and the Senate, those were removed. And they've had significant restrictions on overall on marketing and promotion, but very much it's, it's pro prohibited to market in any way, market and promote cannabis to uh, people who are under the legal age. As I've said, so the products that October 17th of last year were legalized, dried ca cannabis, oils, fresh cannabis, and plants and seeds. And then, as I said earlier, we're, I will, we'll get into some more depth. Edibles and concentrates and topicals are coming. They also produce a little bit of wiggle room. So if you were over the limits, but just a little bit, so you have over 30 grams, but up to 50 grams, or over four plants, but less than, uh, uh, less than seven plants, then it was just a tickable offense. There was no, you, it would, wouldn't come under the criminal justice system at all. And then, um, and then they've, uh, and that, that then is one that even though it's federal uh, jurisdiction, that falls to then local policing actually to enforce that in some way if, if they choose. And then again, I've mentioned the cannabis tracking system. So I'm, I'm just going to touch on impaired driving. There are probably folks in the room who know more about the impaired driving than I do. I'm in a legal building, so I won't go too far. Um, but I think it's important uh, that this, these were tied together. So the changes to impaired driving were, the, uh, I guess the impetus for that was legalizing cannabis. But the changes are much more, it's, to, it's not just to accommodate now legal cannabis. They've made a fundamental uh, rewrite of all the laws around impaired driving. Um, and from a public health perspective, I know folks in the even folks in the room may have a different perspective. But one of the main things that is, is in place now is that police no longer need to have some justifiable cause to um, ask for a roadside breathalyzer test. So they can, uh, as they're doing a roadside checks, pulling people over for looking at your license and see do you have your safety inspection, they can say every third car, we're gonna ask you to step out and do a, a breathalyzer. They do not have to have reasonable cause anymore. That certainly is going to be open for charter challenge, but 
in, in ongoing conversations with the federal government, they repeatedly say that they feel that is, they'll be successful in withstanding those charter um, challenges. From a public health perspective, this is actually a really good thing. Because what it does is it increases the likelihood of somebody actually who's getting caught if they drive impaired. We still have an ongoing issue, especially about young males or with impaired driving. And when we've done focus groups, et cetera, with young males, repeatedly they say, we know the risks of driving impaired. We know it's illegal, but they make, a, in their head, they make a calculus about those risks versus the, what is the risk of me getting caught. And they know that the risk of getting caught, especially in rural Nova Scotia, is very low. And I just saw something recently that is a shocking about, I think, something like eight or some mad Canada. Eight out of ten impaired drivers, actually, uh, of those even who are stopped by police, don't, don't get, aren't, aren't detected. I think that was the number. So it's a significant problem. So increasing the likelihood of being tested by removing the need for any probable cause should significantly increase that internal calculus that people make about you know, all of a sudden there's a much greater likelihood that I'm going to get I'm going to get caught. Therefore, we are likely to see a reduction in impaired driving and the, and the and the significant issues around uh, uh, motor vehicle uh, um, uh, crashes and all the health issues that result from that. I know people say, well, it's infringement of rights, and that's a different perspective. But from a public health perspective, this is a a good thing. The other key pieces that have been put in there, they've removed, they've tidied up and removed some, uh, you know, little small changes which make it more efficient, is my understanding from my, from my colleagues in the Department of Justice. The other key piece is they have now put in the ability for um, roadside saliva tests, uh, and they have certain criteria if it's just alcohol or just cannabis or a combination of alcohol, cannabis, what actually constitutes a level of impairment. We certainly have to acknowledge that the science around the level of, because what they're measuring through saliva test is the t level of THC. And it's well acknowledged that that doesn't, the, the science is not advanced enough to say if you, if you have a certain level of THC in your body, that equates with a level of impairment. Like we have science that, that governs blood alcohol level. We'll get there, but in the meantime, we have to go on the saliva tests. There are lots of issues because THC persists in the body. It doesn't necessarily mean you're impaired. Somebody who's never used cannabis before and somebody who uses cannabis daily, the same level of THC produces a different level of, impair of impairment. But we have to start somewhere. And I think the, the police are working to say, how do we implement this in a very practical way uh, that really the focus on people who are acutely and very highly intoxicated with, with THC that we detect them and get them off the road. And one of the things that Nova Scotia that many other provinces has done is along with the federal law, Bill C-46, C they're establishing roadside sanctions. So under provincial legislation, somebody who's, uh, who is impaired, deemed to be impaired, you can just get them out of the car, impound the vehicle, et cetera, and get the, the objective is to get them off the road as quickly as possible and keep people safe. So now let me move to Nova Scotia. So throughout 2016, early 2017, there was all this back and forth between where, where is the federal government going to land? Because we need to know where the federal government is going to land before we could know where we're going to deal, how we're going to deal with some issues in Nova Scotia. But one of the first things we did is, well, if, uh, if you remember, I went through the, the Section 7 of the Bill C-45. If those are the federal objectives, what are then are the provincial policy objectives? And we were able to, uh, I believe it's a success, by establishing these objectives and we actually have them written into the, the, the preamble to the provincial legislation, which is, I believe, important. That again, the provincial objective, the first objective is protecting public health and public safety, um, as well as, the, as you can see, the objectives around uh, establishing a, uh, a legal market uh, and, and minimizing organized crime. We did have an objective about national or regional consistency. I don't believe we were very successful in that. There's quite a patchwork and a difference if you go from province to province around. Minimum age is fairly consistent, but certainly the rules of public consumption and what the retail model is, is there's significant differences. So 
At the end of the day, with a, the, with, in the province, we've, we've established one new piece of legislation, the Cannabis Control Act. And there's been substantial amendments to accommodate legal cannabis, first of all, to the Liquor Control Act, which actually allowed the creation of, uh, of the Nova Scotia Liquor C Corporation to actually legally sell, be the only entity that's legally allowed to sell cannabis in Nova Scotia. Uh, our Smoke-Free Places Act, which was built around initially tobacco smoke, but we had several years ago, uh, it was really to accommodate hookah, but also knowing that, that there was a lot of public consumption of cannabis, even though it was illegal, we actually put language in there, which all, which had, has all, prior to uh, the federal moves, had already made the consumption of, of uh, or the, the, sorry, the, the smoking or vaping of cannabis in, in, in public spaces and indoor workplaces illegal. And then changes of the Motor Vehicle Act to accommodate uh, impaired driving. And then there's some other pieces of legislation that has really had to make changes in language, not intent um, uh, and implications uh, to accommodate legal cannabis. So where did we land on some issues in Nova Scotia? So first of all, we, the, although the federal minimum age was, was 18, and a number of, certainly the public health community, myself included, were saying really what makes sense would, uh, from a legal age, from a protecting public health, would actually be 21. Uh, but we landed at 19. And that is a compromise between public health objectives, but knowing that there was concern that if you, that the higher you go, if one of your objectives is to get people from an illegal market to a legal market, and, and uh, older teenagers and young adults are the age group where there's the highest use of cannabis, well, if the higher you set the minimum age, the more likely you are, you're keeping people in uh, actually in, in the illegal market. So the compromise was 19. And most other provinces, I think there's three that are 18, the rest are 19. In Nova Scotia, the decision was made that the only authorized uh, uh, retailer of legal cannabis is the Nova Scotia Liquor Corporation. I believe that's up to 11 stores now. One of them is, is the standalone, the rest are combination stores. And there's discussions underway about how many stores ultimately do we need. I think the initial number of nine was really landing on what was feasible to get built or renovated and actually get opened by, first of all, it was July 4th and October 17th. There's certainly a recognition that's probably not enough, but this was a feasible number to actually get up and going. There's also an online capacity. So you can, you can uh, um, order online. So you have to first go into a store, or give age verification, and that you then use in subsequent purchases when you can order online. You know, and some other provinces have followed this model. A number of other provinces, Ontario is a transitioning, Alberta went to a private model, and some are a mix. Um, Nova Scotia was the only province, um, even though the federal task force, their recommendation was not to co-locate tobacco and cannabis because of concerns around facilitating co-use. Nova Scotia chose to uh, build basically a store within a store model. That's because as you say, other than the one standalone, the rest of them are a cannabis store within the alcohol uh, outlet. But we have to follow provincial, uh, provincial uh, regulations on this. So people under 19 cannot go in the stores. They're not visible from, the, from outside of the store. Um, and you can't uh, take your cannabis out of the store and then go get some wine and purchase both together. I, I believe you can take wine in and then purchase both together, but you uh, can't take the cannabis out. You have to purchase it in the store. And there's a whole this and there's a whole bunch of in-store um, kind of a public awareness and information that's there as well. We are we revised this more. We used this opportunity to really be pushing forward and expanded uh, public places, public outdoor places that are covered under the Smoke Free Places Act. So prior to this, uh, it, it, the Smoke Free Places Act prevented the, essentially the uh, burning of any combustible product uh, in an indoor public place or an indoor workplace or anywhere outdoors that was in four meters of, a, of a, an entrance or an, or an air intake. We have, under this Provincial Smoke Free Places Act, we've now actually expanded that so uh, sports, and basically recreational areas, sports field, trails, beaches, uh, provincial parks, um, use of tobacco and smoking of tobacco and cannabis isn't allowed. However, in provincial parks, we have allowed for some of the campsites will be allowed to be designated smoking campsites. 
and that's under the under the under the um, I guess the the, the um, thinking on that is that those are people's temporary homes, and so we need to allow them to smoke in their temporary home if they if they so choose. We also gave provinces. I'll get into this a bit more. The province gave municipalities the ability to go further, and we'll we'll talk about HRM in a minute. The provincial decision was made, though, for youth uh, who, uh, you remember, the federal government said if they're over five grams, they're under federal jurisdiction, but they left it to the provinces. So youth with or people, minors who have who have small amounts of possession, that uh, that that's a that's a provincial jurisdiction, and and they're they'll either just simply have the product confiscated, they may get a ticket or restorative justice. And I think the just the Department of Justice is working out the details of that with with police departments. We maintain the federal rest, uh, uh, limits on, uh, on, on um, how much can be draw, grown in a house, but we also uh, gave the, the, the ability, so landlords, so rental properties, landlords have the ability to, um, to uh, ban the, gro uh, the, the growing of, of cannabis if they so choose within their, with their rental property, and they also have the ability to ban the smoking of, of cannabis as well. And as I mentioned earlier, there's administrative, provincially uh, led administrative sanctions on impaired driving. So a bit more around the cannabis consumption because it is somewhat confusing. So I mentioned what we did provincially, gave municipalities the additional um, uh, ability to go further. And HRM, and there's been, I think, two or three other municipalities that have followed their lead, have said that that outdoor, there will be no smoking of or vaping of cannabis or tobacco on any municipal outdoor property except where it is designated that you can smoke. And I know there's lots of confusion about that and there's issues about, well, it's there, but nobody's enforcing it. But I think we have to be patient with this. To me, this is an important, uh, and I was pushing for this, I'll be honest, uh, 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 provincially. Uh, I think this is a very important step around creating a community where non-smoking is the norm. Because up until HRM uh, passed their bylaw, the, the public norm, we made significant progress in, in, in reducing smoking rates, significant progress in creating non-smoking as the public norm. But our still, our overall messaging was that it's okay to smoke in public except where we tell you you can't. What HRM has done now is flipped it around and the public norm is that it's, you can't smoke except where we tell you you can. I think that's an important difference in terms of changing the kind of social norm we have around around smoking. So we'll see. But that's that. There's lots of issues around that. But that that's where we've gone in HRM, and I think it's uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, um, the, how they roll this out, especially when we get into the summer. One of my big concerns was as we get into nicer weather, when you have public events and festivals, etc. I always said, do you really want to be able to take your take your family down downtown somewhere or to some a public event and somebody can stand beside you and, and light up a joint? And under the provincial laws, you would be able to. So the HRM has gone further than that. So got to move on. So let's go. So legal forms of cannabis. Uh, where are we at now? So as I said, uh, the left hand side that was what that's what was legalized as of October seventeenth last year. By perhaps before October 17th of this year, the federal government is also going to legalize edibles, extracts, and topicals. So topicals are creams, lotions, uh, anything uh, or anything that goes on your skin, hair, etc. The extracts are concentrated products. They're also, for I'm not sure what the reason is, but they're also shifting the cannabis oils under these new three uh, uh, components and, and the regulatory framework. Sorry, that's a little bit small. I had to cram a lot of information. Part of this was that they identified that there's there's some unique public health implications for these new products. Certainly, edible products have a higher risk of overconsumption. They, an edible product, the THC, has a much significantly longer time of onset than 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 uh, smoking or vaping. People don't uh, don't normally understand this, and in certainly some of the states, U.S. states have gone before us. They've seen a significant increase in in, in overdose and intoxication, especially among young people. People who they maybe take a muffin or a brownie or whatever, and then they 30 minutes later, well, it's not, it's not, nothing's happening, and they take more. 
And then once it starts to kick in, they're in an overdose state. So that's an issue on overconsumption. There's also an issue about accidental ingestion. And we've had one issue that I'm aware of that's been in the media here in Nova Scotia of a child not knowing it was a cannabis product, thinking it was just a normal chocolate bar and ate it. So that's an issue we have to be aware of. And as we introduce edibles onto the market, and some of my colleagues from food safety are here, we have all the issues around maintaining food safety with this new kind of class of food products. We also know the extracts, I mean, these, so that the extracts are the concentrates. These are very highly concentrated forms of cannabis uh, that they're allowing on the market, but because of the high concentration, they have unique risks to them themselves, and we actually don't know a lot about them. So um, there's, there's some concern around having these products on the market, but I guess the justification is, like other things, they're already on the, in the illegal market, Let's bring them into the legal market and have a better ability to understand them and control them. And then all the issues around, there's some safety issues around producing concentrates that there's some kind of safety issues around explosion and flammables, et cetera. Um, the other thing is, though, that even though there's some risks, if you look at the low-risk cannabis use guidelines, if you ch which are based on if you choose to use cannabis, here's how you can do it that in a way that reduces your risk. One of the key... Uh, points in those in those guidelines are to actually use a non-smoking vaping form of cannabis. So from that perspective, if we can create products of cannabis which help people shift from a non-smoking vaping form of consumption, there's likely to be overall public health benefits from that. The other issue which is really market driven is that you listen to anybody in the industry that the one demographic that's likely to increase their use of cannabis is people of my age. And overwhelmingly, they are looking for non-smoking vaping forms of cannabis. So astutely, if we want, if we want to bring that, that demographic into the legal market, then we have to have products that they're going to want to access from the legal market. So the pro, I won't go through all the details, but the proposed regulations around the sort of edibles are around. So it's important to know that the only type of edibles that will be allowed to be legally sold, and I think it's important to, just to clarify that it's currently allowed since October 17th of last year, it's perfectly legal to buy cannabis and then make your own edibles at home. You just can't sell them. What's been made legal is actually the production and sale of cannabis uh, edibles. But they are going to have to be prepackaged and shelf stable and single serving packages. And coming back to whoever produces these is going to have to have a cannabis production license and meet all those federal criteria. Essentially, what the federal government has had they, had they have said no to a restaurant sector of producing fresh cannabis infused foods. Um, so they're, they're opening the door to edibles, but opening it in, in a cautious way, which again, from a public health perspective, is, is a good thing. Uh, there's all sorts of regulations around the different food products and, and uh, the limiting the amount of THC, uh, all sorts of criteria around they have to follow the plain packaging rules and cannabis labels on products. They can't be oriented to, the, to children, uh, the types of foods and the marketing um, and there's a lot of restrictions around the overall around the packaging and marketing that has to be there, as well as regulating the other kind of components that can go in there. And everything, any product, edible product that's made has to be made that in a, and all the regulations adhere to existing food safety regulations under the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. So I'm going to end up. So that's where we are today, and certainly where we are right now with edibles, the federal government has produced a, a, a discussion paper with all the details that I just talked about that's out for consultation. And we're certainly in Nova Scotia, we, we, I sit on, I represent Department of Health and Wellness on a, on a steering committee on cannabis legalization. And we're in the process of developing Nova Scotia's response to that consultation. And they're going to be, you know, so there'll be all, all the provincial territorial governments, all sorts of uh, uh, public groups and the public itself, they'll get to respond. And so we'll see where the federal government lands. But we are going to have edible cannabis products in the near future. So what are the issues that kind of I think we need to pay attention to moving forward? One of these to me, the main one is can we maintain a, a, a balance between protecting public health and public safety and opening up a legal market. I think we have done, not perfect, but a reasonable balance of that. 
allowing illegal product, but things like the significant restrictions on marketing, on on uh, the plain packaging, uh, limited amount, limited types of edible products. That's all. Those are all good for protecting public health. But there's certainly a huge push on. Um, uh, on, on groups who and industries who want to make money off the sale of cannabis. So I'm not sure over time that governments are going to be able to resist the heavy push to, he to commercialize. Uh, and with commercialization comes uh, marketing, comes hype on the non-evidence-based health benefits, all that kind of stuff like we have for alcohol, like we have fought 40, 50 years to try to roll back on tobacco. So this to me is one that as, public, as a public health person that we need to keep a very close eye on and one that actually worries me over time. Along with that is that our, the question I have is we're trying to build monitor, what I call monitoring systems. So are we tracking the, all the outcomes? That, that, what, 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 what has happened in the health system, in the justice system, uh, in community services, in society, what are the outcomes that we would anticipate changing from cannabis legalization, and are we investing enough to actually monitor those? Because the monitoring is really important for us to say, are we finding the right balance between protecting public health and safety? Um, and I'm not sure we are. We're not very good uh, in many ways in, in, our, in our government systems. We, off, we usually make a policy decision and then we forget about what it takes to actually uh, get data and information, and not just a national survey, but we actually need data that you can actually, from national to provincial to local, all the way down to individual communities. We're trying to build that uh, in Nova Scotia, and we're, we participate in a federal, provincial, territorial group, but this is one, again, that I, I'm not sure that we're, we've got the right investment and attention on this, and it's, it's fundamentally important. This is a grand experiment. We have an obligation to, to evaluate that experiment, both for Canadians, but also the whole world was looking at us and what evidence are we going to generate from this. Some of the implications of, of edibles. I, I, my, edibles is the one, I guess, it's, it's complex. But if we, as we, there's going to be lots and lots of pressure. The, the federal government has is, is opened the door cautiously, but there's a lot of pressure. They're being lobbied heavily, like from the restaurant sector, who want to serve you know, cannabis and food infused whatever. Uh, there's, there's going to be a whole push on this, as well as there's going to, a whole push from the what I call the wellness industry that wants to promote, like like all sorts of natural health products that we are sold today and promoted, all good for your health, but there actually isn't ev any evidence that supports that they actually have the health outcomes that they're claimed to have. So those are, and especially when you get into the edical, edibles and the topicals, those are really what the wellness industry is going to try to push. Or, can, or even in push even further. So I think, again, this is an area edibles are going to be really hard to resist all those pressures. And once and the other piece is that where, where are the edibles going to be sold? Because once we move beyond that NSLC, if we say, well, NSLC is, 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 is not, it does, perhaps doesn't want to set, uh, deal with edibles, then who does get to sell them? And once we open the sale of edibles, where do you stop? So there's real implications around increasing access, increasing marketing, which then further normalizes the, the use of cannabis. Um, where the, the, the intent of cannabis is not to increase, you, in any of the policy objectives, there's nowhere there that says to increase the, the number of Can the Canadians who are using cannabis. But there's real possibility of, especially as we open the door to, to edibles on that. There's a whole conversation about what's the future of medical cannabis. Do you keep a separate stream? Despite all the anecdote, and there is quite a bit of anecdote out there, there's only a handful of medical conditions where there's even a reasonable amount of evidence that, that using cannabis and, about, and either THC or CBDs actually has a health benefit. So how do we actually do the research? And can we hold back the, the demand and the marketing while we build that evidentiary base? Uh, I'm not sure we are going to be able to because the, that that horse is kind of somewhat out of the barn. But despite all the health claims, there's not a lot of evidence. However, there's a few places I think that we, there's a big interest in how do what's the role of cannabis in in chronic pain, both in terms of treating chronic pain. And I think that's an area of active research, 
But what potentially could the role of cannabis be in, in shifting people from opioids, which we know have significant harms, to perhaps a less harmful? I don't know the answer, but I think that's things, those are questions we need to be actively exploring. I have a lot of concerns around the co-use of alcohol and cannabis, and that's something we, we need to try to actively discourage. Uh, but there's lots of issues around, by legalizing cannabis, what's going to happen around the consumption. And this, I'll come back to the monitoring piece. We need to, can't look at just cannabis, but we should be looking at how, are the, how is the use of a whole range of products, legal, tobacco, alcohol, <laughs> any illegal, other illegal substances. Because it could be if we looked at cannabis and saw, say, let's say in five, uh, two years from now, we see the use of cannabis in young people has gone up. And we say, oh, that's a bad thing. But if that's at the same time, and this is possible, the use of alcohol, which is declining, is, continues to go down, and that maybe young people are shifting from alcohol to cannabis, that may be a net benefit. So we need to look at this carefully. Um, and then the last piece, because it's a, this is a legal a crowd to, to some extent, there are lots and lots of lawyers are going to make a lot of money in the next decade off this issue. <laughs> There's a lot of potential legal challenges, not just in impaired driving, but all the, the whole freg, uh, federal regulatory environment. People who um, perhaps their desire to be a part of the legal market is not allowed under the federal reg or provincial regulations are going to challenge that. There's all sorts of issues here. So there's lots and lots to learn. So I think my main message is well, lots of good things have happened. We're opening the door fairly cautiously. There's some warning signals that we need to, uh, or areas of concern that we need to pay close attention to. And this is a grand experiment that we, ha we, we need to be prepared to monitor and then adjust as time goes on as we build, build a better evidentiary basis. So thank you. Now we get to move into questions. So you talked a little bit about the, the restrictions around marketing, especially to young people. Um, why are those restrictions in place for alcohol as well? Um, perhaps they should be. From a public health perspective, yeah. So one of the things we need to talk about is that is that we're move, we, we, we've introduced plain packaging and significant restrictions on toba for tobacco. We are inter as we legalize cannabis, we're doing this pretty uh, close to the same. Why are we 180 degrees different from alcohol? And so, yes, and we have to recognize that alcohol is our number one drug of choice in Canada, and it produces a huge amount of harms. But it's a topic we can't really have a, for, for many, many reasons, it's a whole other lecture or seminar around why, why, why we can't make progress in alcohol policy because for collectively society, we don't want to go there. So who has the jurisdiction? It would be federal jurisdiction. It'd be, the alcohol would be basically the same where the, the production and all the rules around marketing, et cetera, are a federal environment. The rules around who sells it and how it can be used in a public space or provincial or, or provincial. Thank you. So many of your committees looked at, as you probably know, you get measurable levels of THC from the second hand marijuana song. And THC is measurable in saliva for 61 days. Has any work been done for Canadians who are traveling and maybe going to countries where this is illegal and if they do a saliva test, and they're in a common smoking area, they actually could have measurable levels. It takes 61 days for it to get out of your system. I'm not aware of any of that specific work. I would say that that's an issue today or was an issue a year ago. There's the, before the legalization, there was a there is very common to smell cannabis as you walked around the streets of Halifax. So you that that was an issue before. I think a more relevant issue is what is the is the, what do you do about if you're a legal cannabis user and you disclose that when you cross the border, or if you have cannabis product, what do you do with that? Uh, well, but I'm not aware. I may be wrong, but I'm not aware of any countries where, as part of the entry, they test your saliva. I think it's we know that the U in the U.S. across the U.S. border, they ask you to use cannabis. 
what do you say as a Canadian now? If you, as your legal age, and you choose to use cannabis, do you lie? Do you say yes? Do you? I think those are those are questions that we have, or that the federal government continues to work, explore, and work through in, in kind of international uh, forum. Well, I think one of the ones from uh, is is we have to pay attention to what's the number of what what's the the, the number of the density and the location of, of, of retail sites. The more and the, the, that's you know the number and so we go tobacco, which we get are sold in every convenience store and gas station. Alcohol, we still have. I don't know what the number is, but we have far more NSLC outlets that that don't sell cannabis, and then now we've opened the door more to private. Uh, as well. So we know that good evidence on tobacco and alcohol that the greater the number and especially in a, in a density like the density of outlets in downtown Halifax and the location especially or as it relates to schools those can actually drive uh, youth consumption of, of tobacco and alcohol. So we have to pay careful attention to uh, it's one of the issues moving forward finding the balance What's the number of sites that you need to have uh, to, so Nova Scotians, if you want them to buy from, a, from the legal source, they need reasonable access. Knowing that they can be online, how many fixed sites do we need to have? Um, but also learning from uh, and, and where those sites are going to be located. Uh, so I think that's an interesting one moving forward that we, that we, that we have to continue to work actively, we can't be passive, but actively make sure, are we always asking ourselves, are we getting the right balance between creating a legal market and protecting uh, youth especially? So any attention being paid to the public health risk of increased single-use plastics going along with the legalization of cannabis, whereas once you get in a tiny little plastic bag, now there is a very large, heavy the only thing I know that's certainly been made an issue, and NSL, NSLC is aware of that. What they're I, you know, I, I haven't been involved in any conversations of any active plan to reduce the packaging, but it's certainly an issue that they're that they're well aware of. Again, it's some of that is driven by the federal requirements because. The package has to be a certain size to accommodate, and this will be true for edibles. They have to be prepackaged. They have to be a certain size, even though the regulations will allow kind of like the fold-out uh, labels. But they have to be a certain size to accommodate all the all the labeling and, and signage rules uh, that, that are required. That's a good point. Um, I think you might have alluded to this a little bit, but can you speak more about um, like barriers that people are still I mean, I think the main issue is that there's been um, a shortage of supply, especially certain of the more popular, what I've been, what I, in the meetings I've been at, some of the more popular product supplies, uh, product lines. That's across the country. I mean, that was to a large extent, that was to be expected. This is, we're standing up a new industry that the federal government had to chose very aggressive timelines. I mean, even though they said October 17th, it wasn't until May, April, May of last year where we, where we, we even knew where the federal government was truly landing. And at that point, we were still looking at July 1st. And then we had to stand up a, 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 a retail model as well as the industry, the producers had to then uh, ramp up. New producers had to do all the stuff to get licensed. So uh, yes, there's an access, uh, a supply access issue, but we need to be patient and say this is this isn't a short term piece. We need to look long term. And yes, this, at, at, over time, the supply, the, the economics will kick in, and the supply will be there to meet the demand. Does that answer your question? Um, I was also thinking. I've heard things like because cannabis is available in the NSLC, that that's why people are more willing to struggle with like. Well, like if the is online and like the for like, personal identification. 
I've heard both. I mean, there, there, that was one of the issues that we raised from a public health perspective when the Nova Scotia chose to co-locate people with an alcohol uh, use disorder uh, and the implications for them. Um, there is a robust online model, but you're right, and I don't know the answer. I'm not an IT person in any way, shape, or form. Is there a legitimate concern about your your public uh, your your private security if you you know because you have to put in a bunch of personal information and credit card and all that kind of stuff? I don't know the answer to that. Um, just more about the public mask and So I'm not aware of anything that says that you have to use a smoking or vaping form to if you're somebody with chronic pain or another health issue. In fact, many of those people don't use, they choose to use another form. So I think there's other ways that people can access, uh, use cannabis, even in a public forum. And I've been very clear in all my discussions in government is that we need to distinguish between smoking and vaping forms of consumption and other forms. Because A, controlling edibles, saying that it's illegal to eat my muffin in, 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 on Grand Parade at lunchtime <laughs> is, is, is totally unenforceable and it's unreasonable. There's no harm to anybody else. Like, but if I was sitting there smoking a joint, there is secondhand exposure. So I think there's that piece on it. Uh, but it's, you could, but it's, we had this, the same issues were raised when we moved forward 20 years ago on, on protecting public spaces. It's a balance of protecting the collective's health versus the rights of an individual. So I would argue, even if you have a dependency on cannabis or maybe using cannabis for a chronic health condition, do you have a right to consume that in a way that puts other people at risk? And I would say no, but especially because there are other ways that you can consume, there's, there's alternative ways you can consume that product that don't create those risks for others. So I don't think it's unreasonable at all to, to what HRM has done and where we've landed. In fact, I like, I very much in favor of what they've done, because as I said earlier, it changes the public norm and the discussion that now non-smoking is the norm. Sure, I'm going to come over here and I, I see your hand up over there too. I'm just wondering if you're aware of uh, there being discussions or considerations to uh, safety sort of within the home. Uh, for example, a secondhand smoke uh, with children in the home or um, levels of impairment of caregiver with kids in the home or things like muffin safety issues. Are you aware of or have there been discussions about those kind of issues, plants in the home with kids, pets? So I think, sir, if you look at the information that's online, I said maybe I, I missed that. I think there's one more slide. If you haven't gone to, there's the, our cannabis website, and through that, the Nova Scotia cannabis website, we have linked to a whole range of, from the federal government to the Canadian uh, Center for Addiction and Mental Health, range of things. One of the things you could get to on the federal side is some issues around plants and, and, and kids and, and pets. As we we've, have active conversations right now, as we move forward with edibles, one of the key messages is going to be around safe storage. It's a it's a it should be treated like as the same you do with any other prescription any any prescription medication. You got to store it and handle it carefully. Uh, so those messages, you know, we've had long standing messaging working. Ultimately, what people choose to do in their home that's and around kids. But we have long part of our public health messaging is for long has been smoke outside, and that will con that continues around with with cannabis. Except though, there are people like who now might you know go outside for a cigarette smoke, but can't do that uh, because it's not a designated area. So like, are more likely to smoke within the home when kids are there. That kind. Of so that's where we need to push. That's that's one of the why we need to have other alternative forms of consumption. That again, they're consistent with the low risk cannabis use guidelines as well as minimizing those those secondhand effects of smoking and vaping. So. What I think putting in regulatory environments as well as public awareness uh, campaigns that actually drive people, if you will, to a non-smoking vaping form of, uh, of consumption if they choose to use are a good thing. There's another question over here. Um, I was wondering as there continues to be a growth in, in uh, the health and social effects of cannabis, 
we gather more and more evidence, are there any mechanisms in place for policy to reflect that any new evidence or the gathering? So I think that that would absolutely be through our monitoring and adjusting our regulatory environment. So if, as we get more evidence around the, uh, the health conditions, which I think could be benefited, I think, you know, one of the questions are going to be, how do people access that? Do you, do we still need to maintain a medical stream and drive people that way? Or do we just, you know, so, so I think w my answer to your question is going to, we, we have the whole legal framework federally, provincially has to be open as evidence emerges. We can't just, and I, I, think, I, don't, I don't think anybody's under any belief that this is going to stay as, as written in stone for the next decade. It'll, it'll change over time. Alan, you had a, your hand. Okay, was there a, and then I'll come back to you. Alan. I just wanted to kind of reflect on the piece of writing about a marginalized community. Um, I think the fact went over the village touching on too much. Um, but when we think of people who are experiencing homelessness and the fact that they actually have a home to smoke in, those designated areas might not be available to them, so things like transportation. Um, and then just a whole reflection on the social terms at all. I just want to touch on how that limits them and their ability to consume um, cannabis and So, so I, I think then we need to. So, do they not do that just because they're marginalized or homeless? Do they not deserve the same steps that help them and supports to help them protect their health? Uh, so, I don't think we just throw up our hands and say they have to use cannabis and we have to give them some kind of right. I certainly recognize those unique challenges. So, how, I, my my answer to you would be then we have to work harder in our homeless shelters and homeless populations with nicotine replacement therapy and other supports to deal with the mental health issues which are often driving their use of cannabis or other substances. Not to kind of throw up our hands and say we have to accommodate their use of cannabis. They deserve far more supports from a health and social sector to help to help minimize that use. But if we legalize cannabis, we're saying it's okay to use. So if it's okay to not experience homelessness, I should be used if you're experiencing homelessness. It's not okay, we should well, I think they would have the same ability as anybody else in HRM to uh, to to use at one of the uh, designated smoking sites. I recognize the challenge, but I think we need to, uh, from my perspective, is look at it in a way that what kind of where are they lacking in health and social supports that maybe brings them to a place that there are a greater level of equity for a whole bunch of other issues and, and areas. Um, to the rest of the people uh, in even in HRM. Uh, just to follow up on the question uh, from over here, as have there been, do you know, or does anybody know, if there have been cases where child protection uh, laws have been brought to bear when you know, parents are smoking and the smoking cannabis in the home? Or it's a big no-no. Not, not, <laughs> not, not, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. I mean, that would seem I, I, like the obvious route to the situation you were referring to, but uh, I don't know if there's something in the. Uh, there's not. I mean, to, to me, it would be the equivalent of smoke. You know, in, we have we've banned smoking in cars, and actually, we've also banned smoking of cannabis in any in any cars. But we haven't gone to that whether it's tobacco or cannabis to actually say if you have children in the home, you can't smoke. We do that in a more educative kind of approach. CA might be on the pet issue. <laughs> <laughs> Child protection social workers absolutely say you cannot use, be under the influence, yeah. smoke around your kids, anything. So they would they, it enforce that. It makes zero that. difference to them that it's now legal. Yeah, good. So they would enforce that. Okay, um, I'm just wondering, is the province planning to revisit the retail model in accidental years? There's nothing written in there, and I've been have part of no conversation that said that it was the retail model that we will retain forever. Okay, so it's, it's the whole piece of it. The, the discussion has always been the table that I've been at. We need to. Um, create a, a, a regulatory environment that opens the door cautiously. 
with the ability to adjust and change and perhaps expand as we get more evidence and experience. So it may well be that 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 at some point down the road. In fact, that's an act. That's a topic of active conversation right now. What's going to be the retail model for ed for edibles? Is it are edibles going to be only in NSLC? Are we going to create a kind of a cannabis cafe model where you could go in and purchase non-alcoholic beverages, other non-cannabis foods, pre-packaged single-serve cannabis products that you have to consume in the in in the location you can't leave? Or or the third, or are we going to create a whole bunch of other retail options? So we're actually going to allow the sale of edible cannabis in uh, pharmacies, in convenience stores, in I'm just making this up in farmers market. So the, ex, what what exactly the retail model will look like to accommodate cannabis is actually an, a, an op, a topic of open conversation within government right now, and not just the Nova Scotia government everywhere. The last piece I'll say is that we need to, it's a great opportunity, a natural experiment. Let's look at the impact, uh, especially on youth cannabis consumption in Ontario, Alberta, who have a private model versus BC that's got a mixed versus Nova Scotia and other provinces that have a government controlled. Because I venture to say that based on all the ev decades of evidence in other substances, as soon as you open it up to a private model, you're going to increase consumption rate. So what is it? Let's let's look at the for cannabis and hopefully our any policy decisions around where we go with the retail model will be informed by some of these natural experiments. Comes back to my point about monitoring. I think the contrast between the various forms of contrast are uh, consumption, uh, smoking, vaping, uh, edible oil, that kind of thing, and one would assume smoking and vaping have a secondhand impact. Other Vaping might be better than smoking, but just... Yeah, so, let me, so yeah, there's smoking, vaping, or so they have rapid onset because you inhale it and it gets into your the vast blood system that's in your lungs and out throughout your body. So there's rapid onset, um, but there is that, that whole that second-hand uh, piece. Um, and it, then, then you, you typically have a, a, a more rapid uh, uh, decrease in, 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 in the drug in your blood system as well. So then you're looking for more potentially. Um, the other piece around smoking vaping, which is important, especially for young people, it's a very, it's a, it's, we know that the modeling behavior of smoking, just seeing young people seeing somebody smoke and that modeling behavior actually is an important for, for driving youth experimentation and then moving to uh, ongoing regular use. So that's another piece about the whole public spaces and, and not reintroducing the modeling of smoking behavior back into our public spaces. Edibles, as I said, they have a certainly a longer onset and, a, and, and lasting in the body. Um, and then the other forms are, I think, you know, there's lo lotions and creams and all those kind of pieces that, again, I think they have a, they have a longer onset. But for many people, they're, they're much more acceptable, as I said, or that's the People my age and older, that's the, that's the form they're by and large looking for. So that's about, I mean, I'm not an expert in, 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 in that, in sort of cannabis and detail, all these products. But I think the big difference is the visibility and the secondhand effects of, of smoking vaping. Is vaping less harmful than smoking? Whether we're talking about tobacco or cannabis, probably. Uh, but many of the same carcinogenic products that are in vape, are all that are in tobacco are also in vape inhaling. And there is growing evidence that what vaping produces is very, very fine microparticles, 2.5 nanograms, that there's growing evidence from the tobacco world that actually those fine particulates have unique risk for your heart and that shifting in tobacco, the evidence means the studies, if you shift from smoking to vaping, you don't actually decrease your cardiovascular risk at all because of those, those microparticles. So is vaping less risky? In all likelihood, yes. How much less? There's a lot we don't know about vaping yet. So that's why I certainly lump smoking, vaping together and that we should uh, try to move people away from inhaled forms of consumption in general. Is this one of the um, recognizing all of the work that went into normalizing non-smoking society, um, what is the province planning to do around enforcement for um, the, the 
smoking of marijuana to enforce the playgrounds yeah. and smoke free places. And then, do you anticipate that there might be that inadvertent or unanticipated effect of increased tobacco smoking as well? Um, so the first one, I mean, the province is going to enforce the provincial, uh, you know, expanded Smoke Free Places Act, like we have historically been, which is really through uh, through complaint driven, uh, and then we have enforcement folks in the Department of Environment to um, who, who who then respond to those. Uh, and you know, for instance, we've had discussions with DNR. So if it's a provincial park and somebody's smoking when they're not supposed to, it'll be the local. DNR staff in that park will be the first, first to respond. A lot of it, we're, as we've done previously, we're really relying on public awareness and going on the belief, which has proven so far, when, you know, historically with tobacco to be true, that most people will abide by the laws. And one of the things I ought to talk about a lot is that we need to make sure people are aware of what the laws are and encourage people to uh, be part of enforcement in a polite way. So if somebody's smoking cannabis where they're not supposed to, let's not just walk past that, but just, you know, encourage people being cognizant of, of their personal safety. Just say, you know, you're not supposed to be smoking cannabis here. And I think there, I think there is a place for that as well. Don't leave it all to some official agency to, to, uh, to police and enforce. Uh, there's a couple of hands behind you, but I'll get to you. Um, just wondering to what extent there's been discussion or collaboration with the Department of Health and Wellness with the uh, Department of Education around prevention and discussion with kids around prevention and use of cannabis. So we're actively involved directly with that. So they're in the process right now of revising the health curriculum. And, and there's been lots of ongoing conversations about adapting the substance use component of that for cannabis legalization, as well as awareness about the unique risk of street drugs with opioid contamination, et cetera, and introducing that at a very early age, appropriate age. So yes, we're part of the, we're directly involved in those conversations. So you had your hand up, and then I see you had your hand up too. I think because in Canada, they say there's a, a lot of violence and pharmacists in Canada, they say there's a big problem with opioids. But to the best of my knowledge, there's no problem with the use of cannabis. So there's, I mean, there's that. My response to that is we, we're in early days around the health effects of cannabis, and we need to evolve. My other, only other comment I'll make, you're, you're absolutely right, that for far too long we've approached things from a, 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 a pro, you know, each class of drug independently. So what we need to be doing is looking at the range of legal, including pharmaceutical, psychoactive drugs, and illegal drugs, and look at the patterns of use collectively, and always be much more emphasis on why are why do we have a culture that 
that large numbers of people seek psychoactive substances legally or illegally. Because that, you know, even if we, as we deal with opioids, we're now seeing that there's an increase in benzodiazepine use because people can't, so there's all these things about what's underlying it all. So that, that's a whole other topic of conversation, but I, I, you, you're, you're challenging us to think much more, much more broadly in some of these. Well, effectively increased pricing on these things, that, on the others. You yeah. 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 Yes. So they now have, so I, I'm not, a, yeah, unfortunately there's nobody from justice or police here. So they have all sorts of strategies around how they do uh, their impaired driving enforcement. And I just used every third driver as an example. I'm not, I've, I've, I don't take that and say the police are going to use that. And, and what they now have is that they now have both the breathalyzer for alcohol, which they can use without probable cause. If they feel that you're impaired with other drugs, they have the saliva test and then they have the, uh, uh, the, 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 the police officers who with enhanced training in, in drug awareness uh, that they can bring in. So if a frontline police officer says, I think somebody here is drug impaired, they can get essentially backup by one of these uh, uh, DRE drug recognition uh, officers, experts, uh, who can then come on scene and then uh, do a further, a further assessment on scene. And if necessary, they can take them and get blood tests. Okay, so they, they can say yeah. Yeah. If, if necessary, they can go to the point of, of obtaining blood. But as soon as they do that, they're under the federal criminal code. And so one of the, and knowing that's a very prolonged process, so one of the things is trying to do it early and then apply the provincial administrative san sanctions because that uh, is quicker and, and essentially deals with the problem, which is getting somebody out of their car and off the road in a, in a much more effective manner and doesn't have all the implications of tying things up in, in, the, in, in the court system as well. That's about as far as I can go into that area, not be my area of expertise. So, anybody over here? Yeah, I, I might have my back some turned to you. Sorry. Um, you mentioned that we're um, the only model where we're co located with cannabis and alcohol. Has there been any talk of doing any studies here in Nova Scotia about that co location and how many people are actually purchasing alcohol and cannabis? None, none that I'm aware of. I mean, we were working on an overall monitoring program, but there's nothing that I'm aware of that it would specifically drive into look, looking at that exact question. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to time for one, but there's uh, something. On the topic of impaired driving, when uh, concentrates and edibles will be legalized, will those, like the saliva test trips be able to pick up THC that's been like topically applied and stuff like that? Well, it would be in your blood and therefore yeah. in your saliva. So, uh, yes, yeah. I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Stray and sharing some of the today.